All right. So today we're here with uh, Dr. Stanley Harris, who is a uh, very prominent feature both in the uh, in the wildlife department as well as the birding community in Northern California. And we're going to just ask him a few questions about what's special about HSTU and what brought him here. So just to start, uh, Stan, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, where you went to college, and what attracted you to come to work at the wildlife department at HSU. I grew up in uh, north central Montana on the, on the short grass plains, 50 miles from the Canadian border and 200 miles west of, east of, uh, of um, Glacier National Park, out on short grass plains. Yeah. Uh, my dad was the town blacksmith. Uh, it was all homestead country. He, I was born in 1928, so he was through the depression out there. And gradually his, his uh, people, they, he hired to work for him, uh, the people that were bringing stuff into his blacksmith shop starved out and moved away hmm. during, the, during the 30s. And so we ended up moving to the Yakima Valley in Washington, um, where, where he bought, uh, ended up with 200 acres of land, sagebrush land on, on most of it. And that was in my high school years, and we ended up clearing the, clearing the sagebrush off it and putting it under water. And when, the new, when a new irrigation ditch came through, and we <laughs> uh, was, hadn't taken a crop off it yet, and uh, Dad was in the, up in the roof putting on shingles on a house we were going to leave on one of the pieces. And a guy came up, crawling up the ladder and said, Mike, how much will you take for this 80 acres? <laughs> and we'd already cleared all the sagebrush off and got it ready for water. Yeah. And Dad said, oh, $8,000. He paid 2000 for it. Wow. In 1942. And, and before that, we had 160 acres with, with 40 acres under, under water, and the other was not. We, we cleared that off too, and he'd sold that to him. And these were potato dealers. In that country, they have to have, they have wire worms that get into the potatoes after, but on new land, they don't for the first couple of years, and so those guys wanted it for that. Huh. And so, in, in, within two weeks or three weeks, we were out of business totally. Wow. And so dad went over, the war was on, dad went over to, uh, to the uh, Bremerton Navy Yard and got a, a job as a machinist uh, as long as the war lasted fixing up ships and then when the war was over they laid everybody off just point blank they didn't do a damn thing uh, about easing them into it and so he showed up again and, and he hated he absolutely hated to work for for wages you know for uh, having a boss right and so he ended up he ended up working for a, a carnation condensed milk plant and you know, while I was going to high school I was finishing high school when I graduate uh, when I Graduated from high school and started uh, going to Washington State for my master for my bachelor's degree. Uh, he and mom moved back to Ohio where he had come from, and, and so I never lived there at all. And so I ended up going through the masters, the bachelor's and master's programs at, at Washington State, and uh, went on to Minnesota University of Minnesota for my PhD later. This, well, one right after the other, actually. Yeah. And um, then I got a job out of, out of that uh, with uh, Minnesota Fish and Game Department. I had, I had declared to myself that I am not going to go just get a PhD and go get a job right away. Yeah. I was teaching. I wanted to always teach, but I wanted to see what the real world was like. And so I got a job with Minnesota Fish and Game as a research biologist in charge of upland game research. And I have to give myself, okay, I'll do this for five years, and then I'll look for a teaching job. Yeah. Well, it's about two and a half, three years later, a job came available here at Humboldt. And I always wanted to teach anyway. And so I took, I applied for and got this job. Yeah. And uh, here I am ah, in great. 1959. And so you've been here since 1959, and, and during that time, in your opinion, what has been, well, it, people-wise, who has had the biggest influence on shaping the wildlife program? Well, originally, uh, Dr. the president of the university at the time that I came, uh, Siemens, uh, he supported us because here we are, a little podunk university way up in northern, you know, Orford, 
uh, part of the state. And he, he took on the natural resources as something that they could do special that nobody else in the state system was doing. There, all the other state colleges weren't doing that. Yeah. And so they built, they built the, uh, they had a, they had the wildlife program started. I don't remember the number exactly. You probably have it. In um, uh, with a guy named John Lewis that they they hired. I don't know much about him. And then he drove a drove a pickup off off the uh, Highway 96 into the Trinity River and killed himself. Jeez. And so that, and that, and that by that time they had a fisheries program going, and John D. Witt was the um, head of that. And he came out of Oregon, and he didn't have a PhD yet, but he later got one. And then he he uh, took out he he uh, taught some of the wildlife classes. They had just a bare minimum wildlife classes. Then. Um, they, they hired people <coughs> according to FTE, full-time equivalent students. Yeah. How many, how many students were enrolled in your, in your department? They, they got you so many brownie points and you can maybe justify another position. Well, at that time of the year, of that time of the, the, uh, the, uh, of, the of the season, the, the season, I hope you can get this. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, at, at that mm -hmm. time of, of, of time, uh, the people were coming out of high schools like gangbusters, in there, and we had an increased enrollment. This was in the 60s? Uh, yeah, in the, in the early 60s. And um, uh, <coughs> so they, they could continue to, they hired Jasmine first. So after John Lewis went, they hired another guy that they got rid of. You know, like him. And then they hired Jasmine from the University of Berkeley. <clears throat> and then they hired Janelle from the University of Berkeley. Yeah. And then they had this, this opening that I got. And that's because Yoko, oh, Yoko was already already here earlier. And he's the one who, who started, at, he was a, quite a promoter. So he started the natural resource program. And he, uh, uh, he pushed things a little bit hard and then got demoted back down to teaching, but <laughs> but uh, anyway, he, he got me hired. He, he didn't want enough of these Berkeley guys. Right. And so, <coughs> I don't know whether you want to put that in or not. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, so I was, I said, well, how did that work? Uh, it, was, it was me and Janelli, and then then uh, Jasmine, Janelli and me. Well, the Jasmine went on to to go across to Africa, so that left the position open, so I I got that position, and it turned out, I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out to be a 12-month position, and I was department chairman the first year I came here, I didn't oh, even wow. know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then as the, as the enrollment grew, we were able to add additional, additional people, Yeah. and in in the large part, we, we chose wisely and got good people. Yeah. Uh, and the, the president of staff, what, what is it now? I don't know. Seven or eight? Yep. It's about Some, seven. Somewhere around there. And uh, it's been a really great place for me. Um, it's a, I'm not much of a, of, a, of a grant grabber. Yeah. And so I wanted to teach. And here you could do it and still maintain yourself. And so all the research that that was, I was involved in was either on my own time or uh, through grad students. Yeah. So you talked about teaching, and obviously a lot of undergraduate students uh, come to HSU for the classes that are taught. And in addition to the classes, what else do you think makes the wildlife department so attractive to undergraduate and also graduate students? <coughs> it's the only quality wildlife department in the, in the whole state. There's some, uh, I might, Berkeley might say, but, <laughs> but uh, here the emphasis is on undergrad teaching. And, and, and they, they have, a, we have a master's program that um, some of us want is really bad. And that's fine, we got that. We don't have a PhD program. And, and so we're not uh, a publisher parish type place. Right. And so, so you can you can concentrate on on developing classes for the students, 
and that, and uh, that's basically what I did primarily. Uh, some other people came in who wanted to build their name right. by, by publications, and they didn't last too long. It's because the emphasis wasn't, they weren't out of Berkeley where they could, where that was, the, they didn't have to go out grant hunting. Yeah. And, uh, and so I mainly, any research that I myself did or my grad students did, well, we had to finance that with the, our own money or with the serendipity things that came along. Like somebody would call me on the phone from some former student, say, I've got a job for somebody, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, can, who can you recommend? And after we, after we got known a little bit, our former students would start hiring our own people back. Yeah. When they were refuge managers or whatever. Nice. So out of all the, the classes that you taught since 1959, which one is your favorite and why? <laughs> well... I taught uh, water, originally they had, they had a class in waterfowl management, upland game management, fur bearers management, and big game. You know, the four, the four that we had had at Washington State years ago, Yogam came down from Washington State. And, and uh, so I taught the waterfowl class. But I found myself having been through my PhD program, I, um, which was primarily on wetlands, uh, needing to put some some uh, some planting some aquatic plant ecology into the class to make kids understand, you know, this is not just ducks; they, they, they've got a habitat. Right. And so, I started about half the class ended up with me talking about that. In I don't remember the year now, but when we had a chance to switch from semesters to quarters, uh, I happened to be department chairman at the time, so I stuck in. Uh, a wetlands class <laughs> and developed and uh, which is still there to this day yeah uh, it's not yeah <laughs> right well oh, nobody can do it as good as I can but, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh, uh, I ended up teaching the wetlands class I ended up um, teaching the waterfall class I ended up teaching what I call advanced ornithology which in my case I had, had a chance to rewrite all the all, all the descriptions of the classes and I wrote that up very broadly so that anybody could teach it with any any uh, uh, emphasis they wanted uh, I have to be taxonomically aided so I made them learn all the birds of the world nice uh, in families the families of the birds of the world yeah it was the only thing I wanted to do anyway and so that was a grind but so those were my main three ones and then people kept bringing specimens in uh, road kills or dirt or hunt, hunt the specimens. And so then we had a freezer full of them. So I developed a class called, what do we call that? Um, um, museum Techniques. Nice. And it was an all day Saturday, <laughs> you know, from, from six o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night issue. And I made them, uh, made the students who wanted to uh, learn how to stuff a bird or mount a bird or, or a mammal or whatever. They took that class and, and they had Ten projects they had to do, one each, once each of ten weeks, and uh, uh, so we got a lot of our freezer clean. <laughs> <laughs> so, like talking about specimens, that's when people visit the wildlife department. That's one of the first things that they notice is the rich nice. collection that the department offers as far as mounts and specimens. And can you talk a little bit about how the wildlife department acquired such a, a beautiful collection of specimens and mounts? Piecemeal. <coughs> Um, when I first arrived, we had 700 specimens total. That included mammals and, and birds, mostly study skills. We didn't have anything really. We had a few mounted specimens around. And I thought, well, if I'm going to have to teach waterfowl, I need ducks. So I asked all, all the guys, about half the guys were hunters then, and to bring in specimens that we could use for the collection. Yeah. So we started that way. And then they, they bought a collection. Uh, Yoakum called me up one day and said, you want to go see a passenger pigeon? What? <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was a guy, uh, there was a guy up uh, at Patrick's Point whose wife had just died and she had some mounted specimens. Yeah. And her, her, her dad had been a, had been a, uh, uh, a barkeep and he had them mounted in a glass on, as a, an attraction as a gar. And huh. there was a passenger pigeon in there. 
Wow. And also a Carolina parakeet. And so we bought the collection for a thousand dollars. Wow. And we were buying the pigeon primarily. What year was that? Uh, I don't remember offhand. I can I can look it up for you. But yeah. But anyway, um, and so we bought that collection, and then we had other collections donated to them. And, and uh, in the beginning, I said, you know, we make everything into study skins because that's what we use in, in the labs. But after we got the study skins built up enough, we uh, I, I realized that well, the study skins were only available for three, for three hours each week in the in the lab. We had mounts; they could look at them anytime they wanted to for a whole. And so we started mounting birds. And, right. And uh, a lot of the birds that you see mounted now are from all all sources. They were kids, uh, birds that died in pet shops. And, the students were working at the state and forest. Uh, was it sent to us? A small little collection they picked up, and uh, uh, I mounted about a third of them myself. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe a quarter. Um, so the ones you see in the halls. You know, and my idea was to was to get as many uh, as much varieties as I could in families. Yeah. Well, mission accomplished. So switching a little bit about some of the, the local research that you've conducted over the years, some of it well-known, some of it somewhat notorious. <laughs> <laughs> um, which project was your favorite and why? Well, the Petrol Mania one, I guess. Um, what, was, what was that project? Well, I was at a, at a party, a faculty party, and two students came in to me and said, and they had this bleach is storm petrol in a shoebox. He said, well, we've, we found a colony of these guys. We didn't even know it was there. Uh, would you like to ban this one and turn it loose? I had a banning permit. And so we did. And, and they invited me to go out with them the next time on the, on the on Little River Rock. On the, and, uh, and so in the next five years, we banned 5,000 petrols off that rock. Wow. 5,000 bleaches and about 250 uh, uh, fork tails. Wow. And, um, and so I wrote a paper on, on, on our results there, and that was fun. Uh, Petromania, we call it. <laughs> um, uh, my other, we had, we had a bunch of people, and these were all student projects, I didn't really have much to do with. They uh, banded the uh, bantail pigeons in migration in the, in the game pens. They opened one of the tops of one of the old game pens up, and they dropped down into it as a trap. Wow. And we had well, they handed over a thousand pigeons in there. You got some found out now the pigeons range all the way from our pigeons range all the way from Lower British Columbia on up down south. Yeah. Is there any particular research that you didn't pursue but you wish you did in oh. retrospect? Well I look around now, there's all kinds of projects that people are not doing. Now they they built a marsh project and each of those ponds is similar but different. And, and this is the Arcata Marsh? Yeah. Um, in fact, I was on the, the, the committee that designed that. Um, and if I'd have had the, the stamina or maybe the funds or, or what, I would love to have had that uh, documented better. Yeah. It is, and there's nobody in the, in, the, in the current faculty that I know of that has the interest in trying to get some things going. But there's all kinds of projects possible out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that's the place that it seems like people that we have now they're good people but darn few of them uh, can connect the, the habitat with the critter they're critter people or they're, they're not habitat people yeah and you can't you know never mind don't get me started <laughs> it's okay you can get started all you, you want come along with me and Mike sometime oh I'd love to um so why if, if you're going to give some um, talk to potential undergraduate or graduate students who are considering the wildlife department for a degree why would you tell them to come to Humboldt? I always told them that <clears throat> look there's going to be too many of you to get jobs in wildlife there aren't that many jobs available so a lot of you are not going to be able to get a job in wildlife but if you, co if you decide that you want to come anyway we'll give you the best education we can uh, not it, it, from a wildlife type standpoint, natural history and whatever. And 
and uh, we'll, we'll introduce you to the people that might hire you. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that's what's made the, you know, we, when I first came here, we had 85, grad, 85 undergrads. Wow. Now there's, what, 500 or something like that? Yeah, it's a lot. Way too many. And it keeps growing. Yeah. But uh, uh, it has been a perfect place for me to be because I like to teach the, the students are the best. We've got about 60% of our students, or maybe a little over, were here as as uh, junior college. Uh, they'd come through junior college, and so they were already juniors when we got them. And they, the weeding out of the, of the party guys and the, and, the, and the undergrads that had already taken place at junior college. Yeah. And so the ones we got were dedicated, really dedicated people. And we had we had what they called native students. We had about a third of our faculty, our student body was there. And they, they either got caught into it or didn't. Um, Conservation Unlimited, uh, the student club, helped a lot. Um, and then, and I encouraged the uh, students to to uh, get involved in Conservation Unlimited. And then, then the then the, <laughs> that had been here long before I was here, actually. And then the uh, the student, Western Students Wildlife Conclave got started, which is a you know what it is. It's just a, it's a gathering of wildlife uh, students from all over the West at its place, and they usually have a, a, a quiz bowl type project, and they have other kinds of things. And we've done pretty well on those quiz bowls over the years, and we've gone to every one of them, I think. And now, since I retired, they uh, Dave Kitchen uh, had them go to the national one. Yeah. And and they which they've won. Oh, Dave was Dave was just great. Mm. Um, as the advisor, I was the advisor for that student conclave for, for 20 years or whatever. Yeah. And then Dave took over after I retired. And, and he is, he's, he's been really good. Yeah. So I had a question about the bird watching community here and its influence on HSU. Um, basically, if you could talk about that, how has Humboldt County being a mecca for birders to come to, to find rare birds? Um, and also common birds just witness the, the kind of spectacular migrations that occur on the coast here. How has that influenced the wildlife department at HSU? I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I don't think very much. Uh, it is, it is, there are wildlife people, there are wildlife faculty members who aren't involved in birds at all. And, and there's there's a few, two or three of us who were, yeah. or, or are, uh, but mainly because we teach ornithology or we teach uh, some bird-oriented class. And um, uh, the bird watching community, <laughs> why do people watch birds? Well, they like to see what the bird is out in, the, in their backyard. But then another reason is that they, they they get competitive and they want to have their list bigger, bigger than everybody else's list. <laughs> there's, a, there's this competitive thing with it. Yeah. And um, I'm not very fond of that, but I'm, I have a white list too. Um, and uh, I have a county list, I have a list list, I have a yard list and a county list, and a world list. But, I don't think it's really made a lot of difference. It has attracted a lot of people who, well, first of all, just think about where we're, we're at 40 degrees north latitude. Okay, where else in the world can you go to a, a place at 40 degrees north latitude in the middle of the winter and get as many species as you can right here uh, in, the, in the Christmas bird count set? Uh, we always top that, that particular level. You know, we're not, not quite 200 species, but 180 some. And uh, uh, if you go across the country, then, you know, not even on the East Coast, you have to get down to Texas before they get big, big numbers, or Southern California. And so it's a very variety, it's a very, doesn't look very uh, varied habitat, but it's got a lot of habitats within, within reach of us. It's got the, the redwood forest, the whole growth 
not conifers. And inland, just not very far, you get into oaks and, and uh, drier country. And, and so within a, within a short radius, we can go to a lot of different habitats, and there's always different birds there. Yeah. And so I think people are attracted to this area because of that. They want to, and, and then the, since they, since Rob Hewitt and his, his crew developed the uh, God What Days thing, it's been going, you know, every year for long years now. And uh, it had, it, it's, it's an area where the Southern California birders have ignored for a long, long time. But now they're getting to know us that we have birds up here. <laughs> and <laughs> well, you, you yourself mentioned the the uh, common common what is it, what common poacher. Yeah. What 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 a spring. Pre anyway, I, that's not a very good answer, but uh, no, it was great. It was like some. It, it's a, it's really a mecca for birds because we're right in a, in, a, in, a, in a climatic zone where they don't get they don't get frozen out in the winter time. But it was a place where they come in winter. Yeah. In that sense, it's almost like I kind of think of like Louisiana, the same way subtropical zones where you get a lot yeah. of wintering bird communities. You, you get the ones from back east down down. Yeah, exactly. So the the last question: Do you have any advice for incoming wildlife students? I don't worry. I, I don't give up. Don't expect to get rich, but expect to get a job that will give you decent, decent living. Um, don't expect to get a job directly out of school. Uh, be willing to go out and work uh, at any job you can get, even part-time for a while after you graduate. And then do good work, and you'll get hired someday. Great. Um, I don't know. I lived through the time when, when we didn't have any females in the field at all. <coughs> um, well, now we're now, <coughs> now the, um, the the uh, student body is about half or maybe a little more than 50 percent females, and I always worried about, damn, how these how are these girls going to make it against these old old uh, guys that you know old World War II vets. Well, they had to wait for them to die off and <laughs> prove themselves, yeah. and they have. And so, I, as long as they can keep, as long as the faculty can keep its head up, up and keep uh, meaningful, meaningful instruction going on in, in areas that uh, that change with the times, uh, we'll have a program. But if they let it stagnate and teach the same old thing over and over and over again and don't go out and, and either look at new habitats or look at what's happening to the world uh, and don't change, then you work those things into, the, into, their, into their teaching, uh, it'll die. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Stan Harris. And until <laughs> next time. <laughs>